Um, I have to say I, I see more similarities than differences. Of course, uh, we uh, live now in a tripolar world and not in a uh, bipolar world uh, anymore because many would say that I explained it in my presentation, the difference is that we had different ideologies at that time and we don't have it now. We do have different ideologies here. We do have, and they're built on these idealist uh, uh, elements and uh, also uh, Russia and China, they have their own uh, values which they, uh, uh, with which they underpin their geopolitical uh, interests. So um, in the Cold War, there was one advantage. There was a recognition uh, of the spheres of influence that has been created after the uh, Second World War. So the Soviet, Soviet Union in Europe was satisfied, not so much in the Third World. So in the Third World, there have been many uh, attempts to get some influence from uh, of all the superpowers, especially the US. And, um, and uh, uh, the Soviet Union, but that's what we have now as well. So in different shapes, so we have in, in the third world, so Russia, if you look at the Middle East, China, if you look at uh, Africa, for example, uh, and the US as well. So they are trying to get uh, influence. So that's not so much a difference. Uh, I'm afraid the difference is here and that it's a more dangerous world that we don't have this long piece uh, the political scientists at that time spoke of the long peace during the Cold War because uh, there was a mutual silent uh, recognition of the spheres of influence, what we don't have, what we don't have now, and we're seeing it out playing out in the Ukraine. And if we don't get to that, I'm really afraid that uh, some, uh, it, it need not necessarily intentional, uh, but uh, it can be accidental. Uh, but then that can be can start uh, the really military conf confrontation. And I, uh, when we talk about Cold War analogies, I'm that my doomsday scenario is if you look in this to the situation of before 1914. So if you I just read the book again by Barbara Duckman, The Guns of August, how uh, the big powers uh, slowly. We are sleepwalking into this military confrontation, and a little bit I see a little bit of that uh, uh, right now. Thank you. Well, sleepwalking—that uh, was one of the words uh, you just used. Any reactions uh, to the presentation of Professor Gardner? Just make your make you visible by raising the hand. Exactly, <laughs> uh, Mr. Dahinden, please. Thank you very much. As a first, I want to thank very much Professor Gertner for his excellent presentation. And I did also read his recent book about Eurasia, which uh, I also can commend, uh, commend everybody. I want to make some remarks concerning the lessons to learn from the Cold War. I entirely agree that it is now of the utmost important to build confidence to agree on a set of rules and also to engage in direct uh, discussions as this has been done in the Helsinki process. But I think there are three major differences if we compare our time with uh, the time then. The first is the Helsinki process started during the phase of detente after the Cuban Missile Crisis, after the nuclear uh, arms control negotiation in the 1960, that there was already some sort of uh, confidence and common understanding. The relations was bad in between the United States and the Soviet Union, but this is something uh, one could build on, and I'm not sure on whether we are there in the relations in between China and uh, the United States. The second issue is the following. The United States and the Soviet Union and their allies had a common history of European conference diplomacy and multilateralism. You have outlined this, Professor uh, Gertner, by pointing out to the Congress of Vienna, to, to, to Versailles, and also to the conferences at the end of the Second World War. 
China is a country with no experience and no history in this form of multilateralism. And therefore, I think it is much more difficult to engage with China, um, much more difficult than it has been during uh, the Cold War. And then the third issue is that the world has dramatically changed since the 1970s. Uh, China is extremely deep integrated in the world economy. And China is a technologically extremely advanced country. This was never the case with the Soviet Union. And so we have to expect, even if we embark on a, on a Helsinki-like processus, that we would end up in a completely different dynamic. These are my remarks regarding the comparison. Thank you for your additions, uh, Dr. Dahinden. Any reactions from uh, Yi Chong Lai or Professor Weber? Yes, Professor Weber, you go first. Maybe just something uh, along similar lines. Um, I think the implications cannot be overestimated um, in terms of the relevance of economy, right? Since we know that in domestically, this is usually a large argument um, that goes often is supposed against security interests. And we might have also no longer two blocks that are so clearly defined opposing each other. Or if you wish, uh, polemically put, the non-aligned movement is somewhere sitting in Europe, right? Where a lot of states um, are not quite sure um, whether to take a side or whether to say, oh, you know, in one issue we might follow the People's Republic of China. In another issue, it might be more the United States. So there's less of, of alliance there and less of um, block and building there, I would say. And, and the economy is the crucial point there, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Yi Chong Lai. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. And I think the, um, uh, in terms of the institu uh, institution versus geopolitics, um, I probably will offer uh, somehow a little bit different view, but, some, but somehow also similar to uh, what the previous speakers uh, talked about. Um, first, in regarding the uh, the end of Cold War, uh, the Cold War basically is a, a, con a competition be uh, between the United States bloc and the uh, Soviet Union bloc, uh, and the central gravity of the competition is in Europe, is especially along the Germany line. So that the uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, of course, that uh, the Soviet Union uh, acknowledged the uh, its its own failure and collapse. And the uh, Germany, uh, the the issue about how to solve the, the so-called Germany questions through the uh, consolidation and, and the establishment enhancement of the uh, the European Union, which becomes a uh, at least uh, the kind of the concern, uh, common consensus among the European, and thus the uh, the establishment of the EU as the way to manage the whole EU and also the EU related uh, issue with its peripheries. Uh, but in, in the East Asia, when we talk about those developments, uh, we have to, uh, I think the, um, and although the China uh, during the Cold War era was aligning with the United States uh, against the Soviet Union, but uh, just before, just right before the, uh, the collapse of the, uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union as well as the end of Cold War, in 1989, there's a Tiananmen Square massacres. And that fundamentally changed uh, the uh, Chinese relationship or the perception from the West uh, toward China. That they started to acknowledge that, that there's a fundamental difference in terms of the value, what China possess, and when the issues come to shove, that uh, China is willing to use a certain, peer, a certain method. Uh, and uh, that is the things that the liberal international world that uh, would, not, uh, would not accept. So that uh, the recognition of the different differences in terms of values, uh, not only uh, existent in the uh, uh, in the, the uh, East Asia, which traditionally ally with the United States, but also uh, with China, because China started to acknowledge that the uh, uh, the United States uh, still uh, wanted to uh, subvert the Chinese regime. At least that's what the uh, leadership at that time that, that believed. And so with the collapse of the uh, uh, Cold War and the international regime uh, established right after that, China has a very strong uh, resentment against it, believing that, uh, first of all, the U.S. dominated the world order is something that they need to really uh, uh, contest and even to a certain extent try to change. So that at that time, the, uh, it is the uh, Chen Qichen who uh, at that time was the, uh, the foreign, min uh, foreign minister of China, uh, come up with the word of the uh, democratization of international relations. 
But when he's talking about democratization, international relations, he's actually talking about the multipolar world, so that uh, they need to in, uh, create the other uh, uh, strong pole uh, to uh, check against the United States, the so-called uh, uh, unipolar moment, as uh, described by the uh, previous speaker uh, when he cited Charles Guthammer, uh in his uh, famous uh, phrase. And uh, but. Uh, uh, so, uh, later on, the uh, the China uh, discovered the um, uh, globalization project uh, that uh, came out right after the collapse of the, uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, in a way that uh, could help the China to uh, grow its economy. And if you look at the 1995 uh, during the Jiang Zemin period, uh, Ch China came out with the uh, strategy paper, believing that in the next 15 years. From year two thousand, from nineteen ninety five to year two thousand ten, that the world is actually opening to China, and there's a strategic opportunity for China economy to grow. And at that time, that China also adopted a different strategy, uh, trying to engage with international institutions, especially from the United Nations. So that's why the if you look at the Chinese voting record before uh, 1997, 1998, China basically is has cast all the absentee ballots. But from nineteen ninety and nineteen ninety nine, we started to see China send out its troops. Uh, to participate in international uh, keep, uh, peacekeeping operations and have a more active in terms of the, the voting in the United Nations. In year 2003, when China uh, was the one uh, to manage the North, North Korea issue through the six party talks and the United Nations resolution, China also played a very active role, although it's the role in uh, trying to dilute all the uh, uh, punishment of the against North Korea. But nonetheless, that means that China started to use international uh, institutions, especially the United Nations, uh, believing that it will serve its strategic aims. But the, uh, the issue is still, China regards those international regime, uh, the institutions and the, the order as the one that China need to subvert and need to change uh, when, uh, when China has the enough power and that if the time is right. So that year 2008, the financial, uh, international financial tsunami came out and China reached a fundamental uh, this, uh, uh, strategic read about the, how the uh, international trend will be uh, that came out with the uh, uh, the U.S. will continue have its own power decline and China will continue to rise and so it's just a matter of time when the uh, interception between Chinese power the rise of Chinese power and the decline of the United States uh, will be there and uh, right now it is just that China believe that the the time probably will be pushed ahead uh, much uh, happen much uh, sooner than later. Uh, some uh, uh, within China even estimate that it could happen as fast as in year 2028. And uh, associated with those, uh, based on the power competition, what China wanted to do is uh, right now to change the kind of the existing international uh, institutions uh, to reflect uh, what Chinese power uh, uh, actually represents. And uh, so the uh, the whole change re on based on the geopolitics and the competition is actually uh, the uh, kind of the project China wanted to uh, move into with an alternative model, alternative institution, which can reflect their own interests. And that's what the, the, we are seeing the, the competition here. So I would say that this is not much about how the institution itself versus uh, uh, geopolitical competition, but the geopolitical competition drives a two different set uh, of the uh, institution, uh, especially the one drive by China, trying to, uh, even if it is not going to replace, but at least to be on par as alternative to the current existing international institutions. And, and that's at least that's what's driving in East Asia, as I see for now. I think I see it quite similarly to what Yi Chung Lai just said, right? And I think it's important to historically look back a bit and, and understand that the so-called rise of China, of which many people have talked today already, right, took place in an international scene that was a liberal political order. And the end of the Cold War really meant that we saw more democracies, many international organizations wrote some liberal and frankly democratic values into their framework. Right? And that happened while still a lot of members were non-democracies, but the hope very clearly, and, and Mr. Gertner also said that, right, Francis Fukuyama, end of history, the idea was they will turn to, out to be democracies. Now it has turned out completely differently. Not only are we seeing more autocracies again, but we're seeing autocracies that are powerful. 
So the rise of China is basically an economic rise, first of all, that has now translates more and more into political might. And that I think has really changed a lot, but it is against the background of a liberal political order. And that liberal political order, of course, is not what the PRC is interested in. So right now, in my view, and um, we see four different channels of how the rise of the P PRC plays out in political terms, how the international order is being changed through the PRC. One is a very subtle one and often, unfortunately, still little recognized one. It's just creating facts and shaping discourses. That's where the foreign affairs system, the propaganda system, the United Front system do a lot of work. And it has more subtle effects, maybe cumulative effects, but it changes how we speak about the international order. And I'll give an example later on. The second way is just bilateral exchanges and negotiations. I think that's still the preferred way for the PRC to do international politics because it's a huge asymmetry with the exception maybe of the United States, the PRC will always have its way if it can sit down in a bilateral setting, right? And this is also, I think, sometimes reflected in the language itself. So you, you do have this notion in Chinese on Xinjiang Boqi Guanxi, like a new type of international relations, right? But sometimes the talk is rather about Xinjiang Da Guo Guanxi, a new type of great power politics. And I think there you see the vision of great powers should have a larger say. And if you currently, of course, read the newspapers, Lithuania and Slovenia, you can see how that plays out, right? The third one, I think, is really creating new institutions. New institutions that will put to, bring together many um, governments. There will be a nice photo op, right, for everyone. But behind the doors, there will be bilateral negotiations rather than coming to a common conclusion or a common understanding. And that I think is just an institutionalization of bilateralism. I call that an institutional asymmetrical bilateralism. That's I think the vision of multilateralism that the PRC would love to have. The fourth channel has already been mentioned by Chung Lai, right? It's, it's changing existing institutions where you cannot put up an alternative institutions. You have to work with what you have. The United Nations is such an institution. You cannot replace that, right? By putting up something else. So you work through the United Nations and this morning, Tim Rulig, right, has talked about standards. So standard organizations are very much in the focus there, but also the Human Rights Council, right, and other places where you see how, first of all, the language is changing and after language change, realities will change. And there you, of course, have, you know, the community with a shared um, future for mankind, one of Xi Jinping's propaganda slogans, which has found its ways into official United Nations documents. And which is, by the way, as an aside, right, directly the reason for the slogan of the Olympic Games that we will see in two weeks' time, which is together for a shared future. It's directly taken from Xi Jinping's propaganda language. But this changes institutions as it does with the UN or an IOC or other institutions. And I think behind that is a less liberal international order, one that places sovereignty in the front and center and in which great nations, great countries will have more of a say than smaller or medium sized countries. And therefore, I think we, we do at our own peril underestimate ideology in all of this that plays a role. It's not just geopolitics in my view. It comes really, as Mr. Gerd rightly has said, right, with an ideological difference that we are still sometimes not taking seriously enough. And it doesn't really matter whether one is realist or not about this. So whether the the party leadership believes its own ideology is a good and open question, right? But it doesn't matter that much if it uses ideology so prominently as it does. So we should become more familiar with that in my view. Right? And that means that, for instance, the rise of China to return towards my, and I will end with that, which we mentioned so many times today, I think is a correct analysis of the past, but it's, it's really a problematic if we project that into the future. It's part of the Belt and Road Initiative and other institutions, which are not just change, changing infrastructures around the world, but also the infrastructures of our minds that we all have come to believe and accept that the PRC will be the new superpower. Who knows, right? There's so many challenges in there. If we accept it, we actually believe some a little piece of propaganda there at our own peril, I would say. And I end with that. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I do. I do think yes. Uh, I do think yes. Uh, but 
let me just briefly respond to some of the points because mm -hmm. uh, which I've mentioned. Um, all of you pointed out right that there are differences as well. So that's uh, correctly you, you've, you've, you found them. Um, and especially Ambassador, Ambassador Dagnan uh, said uh, Helsinki was preceded by the don't of politic arms control. That's true. We are not there. We, we don't we don't even have the basis for Helsinki yet. So that's I said it was would be uh, the future. So what we needed is that they don't and you rightly mentioned starting with some confidence and security building uh, um, um, measures. Uh, economy has been mentioned several times. It's true that it doesn't didn't play much a role in the Cold War. Uh, it plays much more a role right now, especially because uh, China and uh, the US uh, are very much interdependent, interconnected. However, I have to say when I said before uh, that geopolitics trumps ideas, I would say geopolitics trumps interdependence and economy as well. So looking at the uh, uh, situation before the First World War, so the later war fighting parties were economically very much intertwined, very much. And politically as well, you didn't need passwords. There were huge of trade. Uh, if politics come in, politics uh, trumps uh, and wins over economy and wins over uh, uh, ideas as, uh, as, as well. So that's more the pessimistic uh, notion. When it now comes uh, to China, I, I, um, Ichung Lai has, has correctly pointed out. I, I, I have nothing to add. I might just use another uh, analogy, which is different to the situation today. Uh, Nixon and Kissinger were smart enough when they went 72 uh, to communist authoritarian Mao and uh, build up on uh, good bilateral relations because it was somehow also a balance of power game against the Soviet, Soviet Union. Now Biden uh, has two fronts. So he, he doesn't have a partner against the other big power. So this, this alliance of democracies against Russia and against China. And I, I do think uh, the US is overstretching uh, itself with these two great power uh, uh, conflicts. So he has this thing with, with Russia here in Europe and then she's China. She says China never shall, shall catch, catch up with the US, neither militarily nor economically. Uh, so uh, to be entangled in this great power conflict prevents all what we have, have, can have in mind with the down policy, confidence uh, building measures. And that's why uh, Dr. Dümmler asked me about PowerPoint and rule-based. The rule-based order is disappearing. We don't have multilateralism. The best rule-based order would be a multilateralism. Uh, President Trump did his job in order to destroy most of the multilateral uh, organizations. So he didn't. He suspended almost all of the uh, activities of the US the multilateral uh, organization. It was China who said, oh, we are not now the multilateral power. We are in the World Trade Organization. We are in the World Trade Organization. We are uh, rec uh, uh, recognizing the United Nations and and China said, we are participating in peacekeeping forces when, uh, uh, when Trump uh, suspended the funding for, uh, for, for peacekeeping. So it turned out that China was at least rhetorically the multilateral part, part country to, uh, in contrast uh, to the US. But interestingly, interesting thing is this Belt and Road Initiative, because uh, basically, as you said, it's or I guess it's uh, Professor Weber who mentioned this. It's a bilateral. China has bilateral relations with each of the countries, but China is saying that's a multilateral initiative. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting how it, uh, the great powers are now plowing, playing with multilateralism. But I have to say Joseph Biden did not return to this multilateralist uh, approach what the US claims to be, even so, uh, the US did not ratify many of the multilateral uh, agreements in the past. So children's rights, women's rights, comprehensive uh, nuclear 
uh, test band, landmines, cluster, bombs. So I cannot claim to be a multilateral power, basically. But there is climate the court is a low hanging fruit. And also the uh, World Health Organization is low hanging. So all the others, uh, arms control negotiations, President Biden is very weak here as well, not going back to that, that was Trump already uh, uh, destroyed. So Dr. Dümmler, Yes, we have power relations and the rule-based order of multilateralism is what the Europeans hold so dear. The effective multilateralism uh, actually is not really uh, the game of the day anymore. So, uh, Thank you. An exception, if the GCPUA will be negotiated in Vienna, it would be the exception of the rule. So I'm still optimistic on that. Good. Well, thank you for these additions. Of course, uh, Martin Dahinden, what do you think about the uh, change of significance of the multilateral approach? Yeah, I don't want to go to an autopsy of multilateralism. It's in a bad shape. But your questions on whether we are moving from a rules-based to a power-based order is a little bit puzzling because rules, international order, multilateralism did never mean the absence of power relations. What you find in those terms reflects power relations. Take the order after uh, the, the Second World War. Look at the composition of the UN Security Council. You had Soviet Union, the US, the Duke, colonial powers, France and, and Great Britain and China in there. This is perfectly a reflection of power relations, this uh, basis of multilateralism, or look at the, then the GATT and that later become WTO. It's about free trade. It's about the multilateralization of the most favorite nation clause, which is an element of US trade policy since, uh, since a long time. So I don't think that there are nations out or people out that just want to destroy an order, they want to replace it by something different. And you see this with the behavior of Russia around Ukraine. I mean, it's not to embark on a ruleless, in a ruleless world. In the same time when all those rules have been put into question, Russia has submitted a draft for a treaty or an agreement because they are seeking new roles and a new order. This we should be uh, should be aware. It's it's very often about what exactly we do mean and not a fundamental opposition against having an order or against having rules or against having international uh, law playing a role in international relations. I have to make a remark of caution. I'm not a China expert, but for the last 30 years or so, I interacted with Chinese diplomats in multilateral fora, but also bilaterally. For me, the wolf warrior diplomacy is not a new kind of diplomatic practice. It is much more linked to fundamental changes in, uh, in Chinese foreign policy. At least this is how uh, I read it. In the old time, uh, in the beginning of the People's Republic of China, China was quite isolated. It did even not have the seat in the United Nations. Uh, the seat was with, uh, with, with Taiwan, completely focused on, uh, on bilateral relations. And even after 1971, when uh, China became eventually a member of the United Nations, uh, the emphasis was on bilateralism, and uh, the, the other panelists have to correct me if, if I'm wrong. I have seen very open, very often Chinese delegations be rather quiet, looking for consensus, and in many cases happy when they could endorse 
statements or positions others have taken. This was how uh, I experienced the Chinese diplomat, for instance, in, in disarmament <laughs> negotiations up to the mid 90s. And of course, how, as this has been said, this has changed. Uh, uh, this has changed. China is one of the most active members now in the United Nations, tries to put nationals in the structures, tries to occupy the important positions, is now number two uh, financial contributor uh, to, uh, to the UN system. So this has changed and I would imagine, but uh, I really don't know, I would imagine that Chinese, China has also realized that the power and the position of the United States depend on the role of the United States in the media, with movies, in culture, this uh, so-called more or less soft power. And I see the wolf diplomacy rather as an element of this occupying the minds, uh, trying to influence uh, the mindset of people, the values. And for me, it comes not as a surprise that the term wolf warrior itself comes from a Chinese action movie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any reaction? Yes, uh, Dr. Yi Chong Lai. Yeah, thank you. Just to, uh, uh, in addition to the previous uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Martin Dayton, um, the, first of all, the wolf warrior uh, diplomacy, uh, right now it seems to uh, point to the style rather than the content of the Chinese diplomacy. And uh, if we look at the Chinese uh, diplomat's behavior uh, in a much uh, earlier time, for example, during the 1960s and 70s, especially during the Cultural Revolution era. And uh, you could see that some of the Chinese diplo diplomats at that time, uh, when they were stationed out, uh, in overseas, they also waved their Mao Zedong's little red book and uh, citing it uh, about as this is so sacred text uh, in the diplomacy. So I would say that uh, this uh, wolf warrior uh, diplomacy, uh, especially when you talk about style, it's, uh, it's more like a, um, the, uh, the reflection of the domestic Chinese politics, especially among the uh, uh, Chinese diplomats. And many of them, they uh, have to reflect or either the demand from the domestic uh, political leadership, or they believe they have to behave in a certain way, otherwise their career will be ruined. So I think to a certain extent, the uh, wolf warrior uh, diplomacy um, when we talk about style, it has the driven factor is actually on the domestic environment. Uh, but then if we talk about Chinese uh, the, uh, diplomatic strategies uh, uh, to, to the outside, I think the uh, after year 2012, there's a fundamental uh, differences in terms of how the uh, diplomacy uh, wanted to achieve. Before that, uh, China still more or less uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, treasure or they're trying to uh, reach a certain consensus and uh, hope that those consensus will be reflective of our Chinese uh, wishes and goal. And then through those consensus to secure Chinese interest. But from year 2012, China started to adopt a more aggressive and even for certain periods, uh, more adventurous uh, behaviors. So year 2013, already a Chinese troops step into the uh, uh, the, uh, the border between China and India and uh, <clears throat> humiliated uh, the, the India year, uh, year 2013 and 14, both of them. Uh, but the, the, at that time, they did not result to the bloodshed. And the uh, Chinese uh, harassment against Japan uh, is in East China Sea and also Chinese establishment of the uh, uh, artificial island in South China Sea, they all started after uh, year 2012 and 13. And that also coincides with the coming up power of Xi Jinping himself, because Xi Jinping took over the Chinese general, uh, CCP general secretary at the end of year 2012, and then become the Chinese president as, uh, at the start of the year 2013. So the, uh, this uh, change of strategy uh, and the uh, uh, all around uh, the issue about the re, uh, uh, renaissance of the Chinese dream 
uh, that uh, reflects in their uh, international or foreign policy work. I will say that uh, this uh, reflected uh, the different kind of the uh, uh, strategic outset associated with a different leadership. And that is more of the recent behave, uh, phenomenon behavior. So I just stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weber, do you want to add to that? Just very briefly. Yeah, very briefly, I, 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 I very much agree, um, um, again, unfortunately for a panel, but <laughs> maybe just, um, I think it's two parallel movements. One is ideological continuity, actually, there's a lot of ideological continuity, even through Chiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, right? But then I agree with um, Xi Jinping, we see an intensification and we see a new self-assertiveness, which plays out the way that was described, yeah. Well, I think the, uh, in the East Asia or the Asia Pacific in general, uh, there was a uh, uh, understanding that uh, the uh, the regional order here uh, is underpinned security by the United States uh, and the economic and also underpinned uh, economically by uh, having an intense in, uh, work relationship with China. So the uh, uh, that depends on China economically and depends on U.S. Uh, security. Uh, that was the uh, uh, the unset uh, the, uh, consensus among many East Asian states at that time. But I'll say that uh, year, since year 2017 and 18, uh, as a comp uh, intensification of the competition between the United States and China, and also later on, uh, it started to uh, become very clear, uh, is a competition between, between two very different set of the institution and the value systems, that uh, the uh, states in this region, they uh, are facing the uh, 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 very difficult choices. The, the choice as if they have to make, even though uh, some of them, they. Uh, still uh, try not to make a decisions about which uh, block they have to join. But uh, I have to say that the, for those states, uh, when they are not uh, like, like, they are like standing in the middle, uh, they, what they experience actually the push from both the US, United States and China. Uh, and they'll make it very difficult for them to continue to stand still the current position. So I'll say in my conclusion, I think the uh for the states uh trying to continue the old ways of the uh, the development probably that uh it will be more difficult for them to do so now um yeah some several economic i wouldn't call them alliances associations are emerging in in asia as well which include uh china just the most recent and it's not that recent but it became very prominent right now it's the regional comprehensive economic uh, partnership, which includes lots of uh, states. It doesn't have a security dimension, but uh, it has a very strong uh, economic uh, uh, dimension. And I guess it's even more important than, uh, than ASEAN. Uh, but we also have some smaller uh, Asian, Central Asian uh, associations, which are becoming more prominent because when I was talking about the emergence of new alliances, some, some have an economic core, others of course have a more security dimension, uh, but also the Shanghai Corporation is becoming much more uh, prominent uh, right now. So you have, of course, uh, China and uh, also Russia in the lead, but Iran recently joined. So uh, and it has beyond uh, the economic dimensions, there are all kinds of aspects which I want to cooperate. Uh, and also that is in Central Asia, this smaller, which is not known in Europe, the economic uh, cooperation organization, uh, uh, as well with Central, with Iran and Central uh, uh, Asian, uh, Asian states. So we do, there's lots of dynamics uh, going on. Uh, and they do not have uh, this uh, security commitments, uh, what, the, what NATO has. No? So that, that's not necessarily that they come to the aid of uh, each other if they are uh, attacked. So that's the deba debate what we have right, uh, right now in the context of Ukraine, because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. So the US is not committed uh, to come to the aid of, uh, mili with military means to, uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, but, you know, alliances uh, are developing and enhance, enhancing 
Uh, also in the Middle East, I, I, I mentioned that in my talk, we have uh, the Abraham Accords. No? That's an anti-Iranian alliance with not a security commitment, but strong uh, strategic, strategic ties are developing. So, uh, but Professor Weber said before that bilateralism is uh, very important. And I do think bilateralism somehow undermines these associations because then states have their bilateral interests as well. And they're talking about Iran. Iran has now trying to get bilateral relations with the Arab states, which runs counter to the uh, Abraham Accords, for, for, for example, as well. So there's lots of dynamics going on. We have this traditional idea of uh, 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 security commitments, which play a role in, in the case of the CSDO and the, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, the Russians and the Kazakhstan, I would say, it's part of the CSDO commitment, but it was an internal uprising and it was not an external threat what Article 4 of the CSDO uh, would require that you uh, come to the aid so that somehow uh, they phrased it as was terrorism. So we have to cooperate on it. Good. So alliances, al alliances play a role, kind of different versions uh, are emerging economically, but they have also the security dimension. Uh, yeah, climate change, that's true, uh, but it's a very low hanging fruit. So Good. we have to go much beyond this. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dahinden? Yes, definitely. There are, there are common interests and uh, we should build on it. You see, the future is not a question of, uh, let's say, forecast. It's a question on doing the right things. And Professor Gertner has outlined which the models could be. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this. Uh, Professor Weber? Yeah, I think there are very many areas of cooperation, but cooperation in this context always comes with cooptation, right? And I, I fear that these fields of cooperation are exactly being the ones being weaponized. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Yi Chang Lai? Uh, well, probably cooperation for now, but I suspect that it will be deep. So that, um, yes, co-option uh, and also uh, very easy to be weaponized because China or the United States could uh, uh, ask for other areas and the competition and that uh, could spill over to this field. So I'll just say that. Thanks a lot. I would like to thank you all, our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, for this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dimler. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Thank you.